and I am an officer with the U.S. Navy and master's candidate at the University of Oxford, and I am a 2015 Aspen Security Forum Scholar. I'm delighted to introduce our next session, Pivot to Europe. With Russia's annexation of the Crimea and the nearly daily testing of NATO's strength, the Cold War is heating up. And if that isn't enough, ISIL's threat is on Europe's doorstep. For all the talk of the Pivot to Asia, this panel will focus on the intensifying threats facing Europe and the need for a concerted and strengthened response. Moderating this session is BBC's Kim Rattas. Kim covers international affairs and the Hillary Clinton 2016 campaign. She also writes a regular column for foreign policy. She is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Secretary, a journey with Hillary Clinton from Beirut to the heart of American power, and was part of an Emmy award-winning BBC team covering the conflict between Hezbollah and Israel in 2006. And with that, the floor is yours, Kim. Thank you very much, and good morning. Everybody, welcome to the second session of uh, the Aspen Security Forum this, uh, this morning. And thank you for uh, inviting me to moderate this panel. I'm really delighted to lead this discussion with our excellent speakers. Uh, we have in the middle Paula Dobryansky. She's a senior fellow at the GFK Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University. She was a former Undersecretary of State for Global Affairs. Ramon Gil Cazares is the ambassador of Spain to the US. He's been a diplomat since 1982, has served in countries such as South Africa and Sudan. And uh, Gérard Arrault is the ambassador of France to the US. Before that, among many positions, he was the French permanent representative to the UN and director general for political affairs at the French foreign ministry. And I need to tell you that I was at a reception at the French embassy just a few days ago where the ambassador admitted that he was a headache for his communication teams because, as he said, he is an incontrollable, uncontrollable speaker. He speaks his mind. And so therefore, I trust that if the other two speakers are being too diplomatic, we can count on Gérard to spice things up. <laughs> now, Looking at the situation in, in Europe, and many of you perhaps know me as more of an expert on Middle Eastern affairs because that's where I'm from, but I am also half Dutch, so I do feel that I belong also in Europe. It feels sometimes when we look at the headlines from Europe that this continent is under siege. There's two wars in its vicinity um, with the annexation of Crimea, with the conflict in Syria, internal uh, economic turmoil, with the crisis in Greece, talk about a Brexit with the UK, and of course, the threat from the Sahel and the devastating migrant crisis. The numbers are astounding. So is Europe under siege? Where does the US fit into the picture? Is Europe part of the problem or is it still part of the solution? for the US. We're going to explore the threats, the state of the transatlantic relationship, and then going to look at some of the possible measures that we can take, that Europe and the US can take to try to strengthen the relationship going forward. But to lay out the big picture a little bit, I want to first start by asking our two ambassadors, Gérard and Ramon, to tell me what they think about the title of this panel discussion, Pivot to Europe. Did either of you feel with the start of the Obama administration that the US was pivoting away from Europe, indeed to Asia, and has it been forced to pivot back to Europe? Ramon, why don't you start? Sure, okay, uh, let me first of all thank uh, the Aspen Institute for inviting me to participate in this panel. Uh, the pivot to um, Asia and the pivot away from Europe, as far as the security is concerned, I don't think it ever happened. I don't think the United States thought um, it had better allies than the European nations and Europe as a whole uh, in, 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 in the task of, of securing our world, our values, our, 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 our community of interests. Um, it is true that um, maybe economically um, the discovery of the, of the Pacific as a, as a world unexplored uh, or 100% unexplored by the United States um, made that, that um, sentence um, gel, become um, famous. Um, my experience, when you were asking me, I arrived here in, in, in 2012. It is true that I, uh, three months after my arrival, um, uh, the, the, the Spanish bed went um, over the ceiling, 900 points. There were all the news that we were going, not going to ask for the bailout and we were going to drag the euro down the drain. Um, so I, I did feel the, the interest of the United States in what was happening in Spain 
uh, because it also affected the US and affected the, 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 the process of elections at the time. Um, so and in that because sense- Because the, the impact on the economy. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so in that sense, uh, again, I don't think that the pivot has been um, as strong or as visible mm-hmm. as the, as the uh, name um, is, is, is uh, portrays. Uh, and, and from the point of view of security, I don't, I don't think, uh, frankly, the United States were looking for allies uh, in Asia um, that would have been stronger than, than the Europeans. Gérard, could I ask you to step in to weigh in? You've been in the U.S. longer, even though you've only recently arrived, or more recently, uh, in, in Washington. Um, was there ever a sense in France that, was there concern about perhaps a lack of interest in Washington uh, towards, towards Europe? The Obama administration certainly wanted to spend more time on, on Asia, but they've been in a way forced by events to focus again on, on the continent and reinvigorate in a way the alliance. You know, for the last, for the last 30 years, I think I have, I've heard uh, every 10 years, you know, people saying the Europeans don't spend enough on defense, uh, the, the Americans are going back, are going to, uh, to Asia. I was posted here in the 80s, and at the time it was not China, it was Japan, and everybody was saying, you know, the, the Americans have to, 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 to cope, to, to go back, to go to Asia. Uh, so it's, it's an unusual debate, in, uh, I think, within the, bel- the Beltway. Uh, but the fact is the, Fran- the U.S. and the European Union are the first and the second economies of, uh, economy in the world, that the transatlantic relationship is uh, the most important uh, relationship in trade and financial sense of it. So I I think whatever people say, uh, what matters is the reality. And the reality is that our uh, our relationship is is extremely important for for both sides. And uh, and simply, we can't afford uh, neglecting it. We're going to go back to the state of the transatlantic relationship a little bit later in the discussion, but Paula, I wanted your quick assessment because I think you've got a slightly different perspective on how the Obama administration has handled uh, the relationship. And I want you to lead us into the discussion about how the US has also managed uh, the crisis in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea. All right, well, first, let me thank the Aspen Institute and also the Aspen Security Forum and Clark. And on your first question, I think it's excellent that we are having this discussion. And I like very much the title. I think both of the ambassadors, in my view, actually were diplomatic on that that question. Because when Pivot to Asia- We'll have to check Gérard's Twitter feed later on. Even, (laughs) we'll we'll have to look. uh, At the time when Pivot to Asia was out there, as you recall, the administration pulled it back. And I think part of the reason why there was that pullback, because there was a question about what that meant certainly in terms of not only the symbolism, but in some cases in terms of practical actions, of the importance attached to the relationship. Did it connote that the relationship was not as strategic as it had once been, or it was becoming less relevant? And I think that the relationship is a crucial one. I think it also underscores this title and this discussion if I may say, the need for stepping back and looking at what is the future vision, Mm -hmm. which I think we are going to be discussing, Mm -hmm. but also what is the strategy? And I think we have been lacking that. In a way, there has been a kind of taking for granted uh, one another. So to answer your question, core question, I think the quality of the relationship has suffered. It has deteriorated. It's not what it once was. I think when you look in different areas, political, economic, military, that in each of these sectors, there have been challenges, Um, uh, you know, political issues. At the time when the administration drew a red line, uh, you know, relevant to Syria in 2013, well, uh, as we may remember, Francois Hollande, President Hollande was out there supporting the administration and the administration flipped its position. These have political costs. Um, TTIP. on Ukraine. Et cetera. All right, on Ukraine. So on Ukraine, uh, the issue here is, I think, Ukraine is certainly a threat for Europe at large and for the United States. Uh, First, because of Russian aggression into Ukraine. It goes to the core of two things. One, it literally, uh, the aggression undermines the uh, framework, the institutions, the values as we know it. In fact, President Putin has been very clear 
in his statements in rejecting the institutions, or if you will, not only the institutions, but the values of the West. So that is one of the core challenges. And the second one is, if Ukraine becomes a failed state, it certainly will, in fact, have ramifications, economic, political, military for Europe as a whole, and for us. But John, I've heard many European diplomats say, and probably American officials uh, as well, say, well, OK, fine, uh, but we're not ready to send our soldiers to die. To, to help um, Ukraine. And I know also that you particularly took issue with the word cold, with, with the, the, the term cold war. What is it in, in your view? Is it a hot war because of the casualty numbers, because of uh, NATO's stepped up activity, in, in, whether it's in the Baltic states, whether it's with uh, other deployments? What is it in your view and how much of a threat is it you think to Europe, or are we making too much out of it in the sense that we're making it too difficult for Putin as well to step back? No, I, you know, if I, I, I had a problem with the expression Cold War, it's because I think it's very important to, to name the problem in a correct way, because when you name the problem after that, it's, it's easier to define the, the solution. And the Cold War was a global confrontation, uh, ideological, military and, and political, uh, in a sense, it was existential. Nobody could tell us right now that the problems that we have with Russia are existential. It doesn't make any sense. You know, in 19, uh, in 1980, you know, before the collapse of the Soviet bloc, as you know, the, the Russian tanks were at 500 kilometers from Paris. Now they are at a few thousand kilometers from Paris. As I, have, as I have tweeted, uh, uh, the Russian forces have never been so far from Warsaw since 1772. Uh, actually, the geopolitical situation of Russia has never been so bad since 1667. So, uh, you know, you have to look also at the geopolitical uh, reality uh, of the world. In, in, in my sense, uh, the conflict that we are facing in Ukraine is a very traditional one. The problem that you have, you Americans, and the problem that we have, we Europeans, is that you have never been very comfortable with traditional geopolitics. And in 1945, the Europeans, we have tried to give, an, to give up a geopolitics because it led us into two world wars. But the problem is, and it goes beyond Russia, that the question mark that we should raise today, is it the rest of the world actually uh, believing in the very much traditional geopolitics? Because if you look at the way the Russians have reacted to the crisis, in a sense, if you use the, the analysis of geopolitics, I think it's very, it was very predictable. At some point, you know, uh, the, the interpretation of Russia of what we were doing in Ukraine in terms of rapprochement of Ukraine to the European Union or even people speaking about NATO was simply that the West was going to take over Ukraine. And in a geopolitical sense, it doesn't mean that I approve it, but I try to understand it from, from the Russian point of view, because if you want to look at a conflict, you have always, uh, as I, we say in French, to put yourself in the shoes of the other side, because it's not bad against good. It's really two sides. What is the vision of the other side? They simply consider that we were taking over Ukraine, which was a vital interest for them, and it, they reacted uh, uh, in, in consequence. So that's really, so that's the question, you know, really. So we are in a sense, uh, if we are going back to 1914 uh, or before 1914, a sort of traditional, traditional conflict. After that, you have the, the military posturing because military posturing is a sense of trying to send a signal to the other side, I'm very serious, I'm very serious. There is an element of bluffing, you know. Yeah, there, the Russians are also bluffing, you know, and, and we are to counter bluff. So that's, that's uh, uh, I think, the type of conflict that we are facing in Russia. And if I say in Russia, it's maybe also in a lot other, of other parts, because my conviction is a lot of emerging powers that we are facing now, or not facing, we have to work with now, actually are very much engaged into this very traditional geopolitical vision of the world. So are we feeding falsely the narrative of a, of a Cold War? And are, are, is Europe, is the US, are they leaving Putin no choice? No, it's, you know, the, after what we are trying, and we are trying to do it with our German friends, the French and the German, 
is really trying to find uh, uh, with Russia uh, uh, and Ukraine, actually, we are working with Ukraine, trying to find, you know, taking into account this, this, Russian, uh, this Russian narrative, uh, trying to try to find a, a balance, a balance between the, 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 the Russian concerns and, and the Russians also passions. You know, you ask to any Russian what is Ukraine, and uh, the Russian will answer that Ukraine is in a sense part of himself, you know, really intellectually or culturally or historically. Again, I don't justify, but, but that's a fact. And also trying to find the independence of Ukraine. So really try, trying to convince that Russia that we could have an Ukraine which is not seen as a threat to the security of Russia the way the Russians uh, see their own security. And we have been negotiating for now for a few months uh, with, with, with Russia with some, and Ukraine with some success, but also with sort of shortcoming in our, uh, uh, in our actions. Well, I think you want to step in, and, and I also want you to address the, the idea that, in a way, there are also areas of cooperation uh, with Putin. You, you've written an op-ed calling for the prosecution of Russia for uh, crimes against humanity, but there are areas of, of cooperation uh, with Russia as well, particularly on the nuclear negotiations uh, for Iran, uh, for, uh, the, the negotiations on Iran's nuclear uh, program that we've just uh, seen conclude. Well, let me just add on uh, what the ambassador said. I think the really the core of the challenge and what we're witnessing because of the uh, illegal annexation of Crimea and the aggression into eastern Ukraine. What this does, it poses a very direct challenge to the institutions post-World War II, post-Cold War, as we know it, which have maintained peace, security, and stability for decades. It also has posed, as I said, a challenge to the very values that we hold. But it's not just only about Europe. I have to say, add this. It's also, it's a broader issue where other parts of the globe are watching. Asia, by the way, is watching what's playing out in Europe because this goes to the heart of the sustainment of the global liberal, liberal order. But ironically, you asked the also, question about- It's also given NATO a, a, a renewed raison d'etre. Well, that's, there's that part. But then there's also, I would say, that at this time there are countries that are very concerned about what next will come from Russia, like the Baltic states, and then the question about what will happen with regard to Article 5. So on one hand, I think that there has been this kind of revigorization, you know, or re-energizing, but on the other hand, there's also, well, let's see how this plays out and the actual implementation forward. May, yeah. so, May so interject, we, yeah. I'm sorry, of course. because I think there is a very good point which has been raised about the values and the institutions, you know, of the liberal order. We have to understand, I was perm rep to the UN, we have to understand that for a lot of countries, this order is a Western order. And that, you know, either we try to say that's the only order possible and you have to follow it, or which frankly won't work, or we try to include in the, our order these new emerging powers. You know, one day I was, when I was perm rep, I discussed with a, an ambassador of a major emerging power, a democracy, and in a sense I was complaining about the fact that his country had voted in a sort of unfriendly way, and his answer was very simple. He said, Gérard, we are not on, on the table of the board of, of directors. It's your, it's your place. And it's true, when you go to the UN, we have three uh, veto powers. We have always, with the West, nine votes. We have always nine votes, which is the majority. The majority. You go to the, to the UN building, all the, 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 the people are from, from the West, you know, or from the West, American, British, uh, Swedish, and, and so on. You go to the IMF, a French, to the World Bank, an American. So we have also to, to, to realize that our liberal order is really our. And you have countries, including democracies, which don't feel at home in this order. And that's a great way to lead into some of the differences within Europe, even, about what is the real, most pressing, urgent threat. Because it's important, as Gérard mentions, to be able to uh, walk in the other person's shoe. And I want to come to you, Ramon, because you know, perhaps for the French and the Germans and, and countries more to the east in Europe, 
Ukraine and, and what's happening there is the most pressing problem, but for countries like your country, it is more the migrant crisis. For France, it is also the war in Syria because that has certainly implications uh, for, for France with the spread of uh, radical uh, militants who are returning from Syria. Ukraine is very far from Spain, and I think um, your uh, foreign minister once said that to an, to an American secretary of, of state. Do you feel that Washington understands the urgency of the problem for a country like yours? I mean, we're talking about 200,000 people who have tried to cross the Mediterranean in the last year. 1,800 of them have died doing so. Um, okay, two things. Uh, it is true that uh, we, don't, we don't even know when, how far the, the cannons of Moscow are from Madrid. Uh, and we've, we've never had, we've never had <laughs> that, 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 that feeling. We've never had that. <laughs> Uh, uh, that feeling, uh, and but it is true that we're scared with uh, with the Russian with the Russian issue because of what Paula was saying. There's a set of institutions that we um, gave ourselves, and all of a sudden, many of 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 the um, laws that we establish are being violated by the um, by Russia. Uh, but true, the, the the real threat, and I think in in the, in the last uh, summit in Wales. Um, came clear for the southern members of, the, um, of NATO and of the EU uh, is, is the north of Africa. I mean, the, the, the different, so yeah, you, you get an idea, and it's not only the, the immigrant issue that, that it is, the, the difference in, in per capita income between the, the um, north and southern banks of the Mediterranean is at least three times that of, of the Rio Grande between the US and, and, and Mexico. If you take into account the, the, the countries to the south of, um, of Morocco, Algeria, uh, that even multiplies by um, um, a couple. So we have the problem that those um, uh, countries, it is not that they, they risk um, uh, falling in, 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 into becoming a failed state. It's that one of them is a big failed state, which is Libya. Uh, we uh, won in, in one of them, uh, Tunisia, started uh, the um, Arab awakening or the Arab spring, however you want to call it. And now it's doing well and it's being attacked precisely because it's doing well. And then in a, in a, in a, a peculiar case, we have uh, Algeria that suffered the um, uh, Arab spring 10 years back and it cost them 300,000 dead in Morocco, which is doing pretty well, but one never knows. Uh, the, the, this, the situation is, is not... Um, solid in the whole region. And along with that, there's this group, and, and the, the, previ the, the, the previous um, session was talking about, of the small groups linked previously to Al-Qaeda, now linked some of them to ISIL, full of weapons from the armories of, of uh, Gaddafi when the uh, um, regime was dismantled. And this big business of human trafficking that's uh, going along the old trails of the trade in, in Africa. And that's taken place every single day, and it's been taking place for the last, what, five years at least. Now, uh, the most successful trail is the one going through Libya. Before, it was going th uh, through uh, Senegal and Mauritania to the Canary Islands. So we've all suffered that, and, and we've seen the results in Spain we have, the, the attacks in 2004 were done by immigrants that came in, in that way. So that's, uh, it's a real thing that we're feeling. But so far, the, the, Euro the European Union, individual European countries have failed to really address this properly. And the idea of a military solution going after the boats of the smugglers who are bringing people across the Mediterranean, that hasn't gone anywhere and is probably not the right solution either. Your foreign minister said that trying to distribute uh, the migrants who arrive um, in, in Europe uh, uh, across the, the continent is like trying to deal with a leaky roof by distributing the water between the rooms instead of fixing it. How does Europe come together to find a solution? Yeah, and and not, Paula, where does the US fit into this? And Gerard, perhaps you want to weigh in as well. That was not a very happy well. expression by our minister. We all agree on that. Uh, but. Um, the, the truth of the matter is that we're doing it the best we can. I, I mean, you cannot, this, this is a wave of immigration uh, that's coming uncontrolled with a country that you cannot control and with other countries that are doing their best to try and, and keep them within their own country and, and not jumping um, 
to Lampedusa, to Malta, or jumping uh, the fences in, in our cities in the north of Africa, Ceuta and Melilla. Um, but the, the, the issue of security is, is something we're very concerned about. It, it is true that once they're in, in Europe and it becomes a social issue and you have to uh, uh, divide or, or uh, uh, do some burden sharing with Italy, in this case, that is the one that's receiving the most immigrants, uh, it's, it's difficult because you don't know how to do it. And the problem this time around was that the Commission came up with a, a proposal and we don't know what the rationale of it was and, and, and people were complaining. So we've all given the image that we're a bit uh, stingy and, and not very, uh, not, not show lots of solidarity with Italy. But that, that we will solve. The problem, the real problem, is the control of the, of the immensity of the Sahara. Uh, with, and, and the with ungoverned spaces as the well. The ungoverned whether, spaces whether with, small, with, small, with small groups uh, related to, uh, to uh, Al Qaeda or, or uh, ISIL. And Gerard and Paula, could you weigh in and, and Tell us, do you think that the U.S. failed to see the gravity, the long-term gravity of, of a conflict in, in Syria and what it would mean for Europe, whether it's in terms of um, the, 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 uh, the, the back and forth of, of militants, whether it's uh, to do with the migrant crisis? Did the U.S. fail to see that this was going to become a problem for its allies in Europe, Gérard? No, I think in a new world that we are, we are going to face and that we are facing, I think it's unavoidable that the US, the European countries, or uh, you know, the Asian allies, they could have different strategic priorities. You know, really, I, I do understand for that for, for the Americans, uh, the problem of the foreign fighters, uh, you know, yesterday we heard the director of the FBI saying that the number of Americans in, in Syria is in the dozens, uh, actually, for the French, we had 1,600 French who went to Syria or in Syria or back from Syria. We consider that right now we have 500 French in Syria, and already 100 have been killed. And so, you know, the figures, when you look at the figures, it's, of, it's dramatically different. And uh, for us, Syria is the major security problem that what we, we, we have been facing. You know, these guys are coming back, trained and radicalized. We have not identified all of them. And, and you know that we have been already subjected victims of, of terrorist attacks, and some may, uh, some may happen. So, it's, so in a sense, you know, here we, we can consider that we have, uh, in a very legitimate way, considering the, the American uh, national interest and European national interest, uh, that we have maybe different priorities. You know, when you look at the ISIL problem, uh, what I feel as a nuance between the Americans and the Europeans is that for, for the Americans, it's an Iraqi crisis, that for the Europeans, it's a Syrian crisis, very, uh, very clearly. In a sense, we have the impression that if ISIL uh, or ISIS or Daesh uh, could be pushed back to Syria, for the Americans, the, the solution would have been reached. Uh, for us, it would, have been, it would be a disaster, <laughs> in a sense. So that's, I think that's the new world in which uh, 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 we, are, we are living. We can't expect the Americans to rush uh, uh, to solve any crisis anywhere, anywhere in the world. But you are America's allies in Europe. And so at what point do you feel like perhaps the US isn't there for you when it needs to be or fast enough? For example, in Libya in 2011, or even in 2013 when President Obama pulled back from a strike against Syria, Paula, you just brought this up, uh, President Hollande felt rather let down. And he, in fact, brought it up again uh, earlier this year after the Charlie Hebdo uh, attack when he said if the international community had acted more strongly uh, on the Syria crisis, perhaps uh, we wouldn't be here. It was a very interesting direct correlation, which was almost quite provocative, but, but is interesting. And so I would like you, Paula, to, to, to weigh in and, and, and tell, tell us how you think the U.S. views these problems when it's you know, from a distance. Well, look, we, have a, we have a direct interest for our own national security in having the maintenance of peace, security, and stability in Europe. The migration issue, the uh, terrorism issue, as the ambassadors have discussed, all of these have been of grave concern to Europe. In addition, compounded by the aggression in the East, compounded by economic stagnation and unemployment, there have been a range of issues. There's an internal crisis. We have a stake in that. And from that standpoint, I do think that you asked about Syria, and I already suggested, 
we missed some very direct opportunities for collaboration, not only with our allies in Europe, but with those in the Middle East. And those missed opportunities have had really very strong ramifications and consequences which we're witnessing today. So I would differ. I think that when you go back, there were absolutely missed opportunities and political costs in our own relationship. I will say, added to that, we spoke about Ukraine. Let me add in the mix, there are 1.3 million people displaced in Ukraine. And that is not a fact that is that well known. People who are impacted by the war that's going on there. So leadership matters, engagement matters. It doesn't mean that we always have to have the exact same tactical script. But I think when you look back, what has been the strength of our post-Cold War institutions about the values and in many ways, the broad common vision that we've had is that it has always been backed up by consultation and figuring out how we go forward. And that's the last point I just make, I haven't seen that during this time there has been this kind of vigorous kinds of consultation um, uh, in this period uh, up until the recent time. And I think that consultation is absolutely necessary in terms of ensuring the strength of our relationship. It has to be there. All administrations have had it, but at the beginning of this one and just up to the uh, uh, present time, it hasn't been vigorous, and that's needed. And that leads us into the, the next part of our discussion. And, and Gerard uh, and, and Ramon, I would like to um, come to you on this. And Gerard, if you would still like to say something about 2013 or whether France felt let down or not, or whether in hindsight you <laughs> think it was the best I'm decision. Not going to, I'm not going to comment what my president said. <laughs> so you are a true diplomat, but I, I want you to tell us both, I want you to respond to Paula's uh, point about whether there has been enough intense consultations with European allies. I just heard you, Gérard, say that you almost don't need an ambassador anymore because the, the relationship between France and the US is, is so strong. You would be out of a job, of course, and, and we like having you in Washington. Um, but do you agree that there hasn't been enough consultation? After all, you know, President Obama has gone many times to Europe. John Kerry, the Secretary of State, goes there often. There has been a lot of bilateral back and forth. In this case, just to clarify, I'm talking about telephonic conversation, sure. which many presidents and down have leaders have formed personal relationships that have had an impact on the course of policy in our relationships. I, I, I would try, you know, uh, when, when the diplomat wants to avoid to answer a question, usually widens the debate. So I'm going to widen the debate, <laughs> you know, really. And uh, no, I, again, I'm, I'm really deeply convinced uh, that we are facing a new world, and it will be extremely dangerous to go back to the old recipes, basically the Americans and the Europeans trying to solve the problems of the world. It won't work anymore. And so I really insist on this point because, of course, you know, really uh, all the, the p countries are lazy. You know, really, basically, they take the software they have in a drawer, and the software the Americans have, it's containment, Cold War, and, and so on. We, have, we are facing a new world. We have new, uh, new actors. India, South Africa, Brazil. Uh, not only this, 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 these countries, we have also countries, you know, really in Latin America, which are very vi vibrant, active, and which are democracies. We have to work with these countries. But working with these countries doesn't mean simply calling uh, uh, the president of Brazil saying, oh, by the way, what do you think of that? It means associating them to the, the, the management of the world. So we have to think also our institutions, which are born in 1945, the Security Council, uh, the IMF. You know, when the Chinese create this development bank, you know, why? Because simply the US Congress has refused you know, the reform of the IMF. So it's totally normal in a sense that the Chinese say, okay, you don't want us in the, in the driving seat? We are going to create our own, uh, our own institutions. So we have to think also in this, the terms of world order. I think, you know, the, the book of, of Henry Kissinger, I think was a good basis. You know, we don't have any world order. We don't speak the same language anymore. You know, and that was a problem that we had with, with Russia. So we have to, to adjust ourselves 
to this new world. I'm sorry to be too uh, intellectual, but after all, I'm a sort of a French, but, but so, so I can do it. True to tradition. No, let me jump into that and, 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 and dare to disagree a little bit yeah. with, with Gerard. Uh, when you're uh, 12 miles um, from, from the north of Africa with everything that's happening, I'm going to go over it, mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult to say, let's call on the South Africans and the Brazilians to see uh, what they think. Uh, and sometimes when you have a country like uh, Libya uh, breaking apart uh, after all the efforts that have been done and, and splitting into different militias and with all uh, that, that uh, implies for the security of our country, it is true that at the end we rely on the neighbors, the friends that have done the most in, in Africa with, with Mali, the Italians, and the U.S., of course, and, and, and it is then that, that you see where your um, real neighbors in the security matters, which are the really important are. Then we, we have to build, it is true, a, a new uh, legality, a new world where there'll be uh, something more automatic that everybody would react at the same time to the different crisis, uh, but that's not the, 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 the fact that we're facing right now. So when the Assistant Secretary of State for Eurasia, Toria Nuland, speaks of a trans transatlantic renaissance, you think that's great, Gérard, you think that's a throwback to the past? I definitely think that's great. That's great. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know that's, I, love, I love the, I love the questions either. where the, uh, the, the, the answer is, uh, is obvious, so really, that's great. <laughs> you know, so really. transatlantic renaissance, part of a new, new way of, of, of looking at, um, at the world. But Gérard, you talk about uh, the fact that you know, countries in the West go back to their old toolbox. Mm. Uh, so do you disagree then with US concerns about um, defense spending in Europe? We heard Samantha Power saying that you know, there's a dangerous uh, gulf in, in defense spending. And I'll quote uh, Toria Nuland again, who's always very colorful with her mm -hmm. language, of course. I'm dismayed that our allies expect to sleep safely at night on the cheap and ever cheaper. Only the UK uh, is currently meeting its target of 2% of GDP on defense spending. Is that an area and where Greece. everybody, and, and, Gre Greece, and, Greece. and Greece, and Greece, which has so many other problems. We're not gonna start talking about the Greek uh, crisis. There'll be no end to it. But is this the wrong focus? Uh, really, frankly, for the last 30 years, I have heard American leaders talking about sharing the burden. You know, that's, that's a, a story, that the usual story, the usual really, uh, I think, noise in, in a transatlantic relationship. If we, the Europeans, we decide our defense budget is because we are sovereign countries deciding of our defense budget on the basis of the analysis of the threat, period. Uh, so that's, you know, really, and nobody has to complain about what, what we have decided in a sovereign, in a sovereign way. Uh, no, it's really, frankly, it's not the, the, the issue. And I should even add that, uh, don't forget that the, the West, the West, NATO plus Japan plus Australia, South Korea, we are spending more than 70% of the military world expenditure. So I'm not convinced that really, frankly, uh, we, have to, we need to spend more. You know, really, the problems that we are facing are second, you know, are not, first of all, military. And there is maybe another emphasis, especially in this sort of forum, of the, on the military means, which is dangerous, because as you know, when you have a great, when you have a big hammer, you consider that any problem is a nail. You know, really, so let's not think to, to, to be too insistent on the military, military power. You know, when you see uh, immigrants uh, trying to cross the, uh, the, Atlant uh, the, the Mediterranean Sea, you know, it's, it's not a military, it's mm -hmm. not basically uh, mainly a military threat. I think say that, with all the due respect to my British colleagues, um, unfortunately he's not here, so I can really, I can say, uh, actually, we the French, we are not bad at all. You know, we are deploying thousands of soldiers who are fighting right now in Africa against the terrorists, uh, fighting the terrorists also in, in Iraq. We are ready to do, uh, uh, to do our job. Uh, but don't forget that the European Union itself is, spend, is giving 70% of the world aid to development. And that's also quite important. And of course, one of the mechanisms, sorry, go, go ahead, Paul. I just wanted to add, uh, because you said it isn't so much an issue, I would say, meaning about the defense spending, 
Mm -hmm. uh, members of our Congress have brought this forward. And there have been many hearings on this question because of the nature of the alliance, the threats that it's facing, and the importance of burden sharing. So I wouldn't discount it as, uh, as, as, as you have stated. But I did want to just say this. It, the comments that are made really in my book really call for a very important point. And this is why I've been excited about the fact that the forum is holding this panel. And that is, we haven't stepped back and really looked at where is Europe going? What's the future of Europe? Let's assess it, the myriad of problems, and what should the US strategy be? And I wanted just to put this in. I do happen to be affiliated with the Atlantic Council. And the Atlantic Council is actually launching such an assessment. And I think it's long overdue. I think exactly. it's really crucial that this be done for all the reasons that have been stated up here. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. We're going to be going to questions shortly. But is that one of the mechanisms that is, aside from defense, aside from diplomacy, going to put the economic partnership between the two sides of the Atlantic on par with security and diplomatic ties? I'd say absolutely. TTIP matters greatly. Um, uh, the ambassador, uh, Gerard, uh, uh, mentioned earlier the importance of our economic relationship, the volume of our trade. It is substantial. It's a win-win for both Europe and for us. <clears throat> but the one thing I would add where we do have a challenge now is coming out of the European Commission, many of the regulatory challenges that some of our businesses are encountering. So that's in the mix, which has to be sorted through. But TTIP, absolutely. I'm, I'm not going to go into the exact details of whether, whether, what comes from the European Commission, what comes from the USTR. But um, I, I just want to give a message. We've been preaching for decades to the rest of the world the importance of free market, um, uh, the free economy, rule of law. Uh, if all of a sudden, and, and, and we've signed um, uh, free trade agreements with everybody. Uh, I mean, the Latin Americans, the Asians, both the US and, 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 and the EU. And all of a sudden, when it comes to agreeing between ourselves, we're amongst ourselves. It's when probably quite hard. When we're fighting, when we're not punching uh, below our weight, and we're, fighting, we're not going to uh, reach an agreement. The message that we're going to send to the rest of the world is that that uh, partnership doesn't work that well, and that the values that decide to sell to us is not what they accept. So I think that, that there's a political message in, in the TTIP that I think we have to uh, solve by uh, reaching a good agreement. Before we go to questions, I have two more brief questions for each one of you, if you could answer briefly and help us bring the, the discussion to a close. Is it about looking for, is it about more mechanisms to strengthen the cooperation uh, or are the current structures enough? Is it about more military bilateral um, cooperation? You know, the, uh, the, the, the Spain has just agreed to uh, permanently host um, US, the, the US base in, in, in Moron. Um, or is it just about going back to the basics of engaged, sustained diplomacy? If I could have each one of you just briefly tell me what, you, what your thought is on that. what you said. It's a Spanish base where the military oh, force yes. has been enlarged. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, and and uh, um, I, I, I think it's, uh, listen, the, 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 uh, and Zara was saying, the, the new world is much more complicated than the institutions we have to rule them. Uh, to rule it, and, and so that's when we're having these relations between the US and Europe sometimes are bilateral with the, um, basically the important members and, and sometimes some others and, and, and in issues that uh, are of interest to the US, they, they contact maybe not uh, Brussels, but uh, I don't know, uh, tying or Copenhagen. Or Merkel, yeah. Yeah, or Merkel, or Merkel, sure, sure, for sure. And, and, um, so, so I think that, um, and I've forgotten what the question was. So. Well, whether it's about more diplomacy or whether it's about putting in place new structures okay, or but, but more diplomacy, frameworks. Okay, diplomacy, but diplomacy matters, and I think what sometimes we might lack from time to time is a bit more visibility. Gerard? More diplomatic engagement through the ambassadors in Washington. <laughs> I support that. Paula, my answer you? is you, have, you sure. have to have both. You have to have both. Absolutely. And, and there is need for a reassessing Europe, as I stated, as, as, as yes. you said. And then very briefly, each one of you, how do you define a common goal for the US and Europe? What are you working towards together? To build a new world order. Paula? Uh, 
I would say the common goal is the one we have traditionally have had, which is the maintenance of peace, security, and stability, and not only in Europe, but also uh, globally, and working together with our strong partnership. Ramon? I, well, I agree with, with both, but I will say with, with our values. I mean, if we believe in our values, uh, I think they are as are universal and could be valid, uh, adjusting them to the different cultures, and we should defend those values. All right. We have time for a few um, questions. If you could raise your hand and introduce yourself. Uh, the gentleman with the checkered shirt. Checkered shirt. And two of our panelists have to leave at 10.45, so we're going to end very promptly. I will make my wonky question quick. Uh, my name is Brian Rosinski. I'm a PhD student at George Washington and one of the scholars that Aspen has graciously brought over here for us to uh, meet all of you distinguished um, thinkers and practitioners. Um, several of you described the many, many challenges that Europe is facing from within and without and on its borders. And it sounds like the consensus is the Cold War toolbox doesn't really work. And one of those tools is nuclear deterrence. There have been prominent calls to bring more nuclear weapons to Europe, to bring nuclear weapons to Asia. It sounds to me like these challenges are not easily addressed by these capabilities and this framework, but I'm curious to hear even while NATO remains a nuclear alliance, what role you see for nuclear weapons in Europe moving forward? Gérard, Paula. Paula, Paula, Paula. <laughs> but France is I'm the, the only, nuclear... I'm the only, I'm the only nuclear 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 I, I will defer to Europe first. <laughs> no, I think, you know, in a sense, uh, nuclear deterrence for, for my country, because it's national, uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, a national, it's in no way integrated with, in NATO, uh, you know, really, it's the ultimate assurance. You know, you have to understand that for France, uh, the basic experience of the of the of, of uh, recent history was 1940, where uh, we were alone, let alone in, in front of, of Germany. Uh, there, there was a very moving letter of the French Prime Minister in June 1940 to President Roosevelt, saying, "You know, we are a democracy. We are overwhelmed uh, by the, the invasion. Please help us." And of course, uh, the U.S. didn't do it and we were overwhelmed, and we were defeated. And that, for us, was the major experience. We know that when the, the hard times come, you are alone. And that's the reason why we have uh, a nuclear deterrence, and that's the reason that we consider that it's part of our, uh, really, existence in a world where you can't forecast anything. For the moment, it's very unlikely that you need, actually, that nuclear deterrence should be uh, in a sort, invoked or so we really should have a role. But in 20 years, in 30 years, in 40 years, we, we don't know. Uh, so that's, that's really, the, the, in a sense, uh, the core of our commitment to nuclear deterrence. And I'd just answer briefly, we're talking about Ukraine. You may recall Ukraine was a uh, nuclear uh, uh, power. It had nuclear weapons. It gave those up through the Budapest Memorandum in return for the territorial integrity and sovereignty. Many Ukrainians now, when you hear the officials speak, they regret that action. So I think that the nuclear deterrent is very much out there. What happened in that case and that abrogation of that Budapest memorandum, you also look at press in other parts of the world. I remember at the time, actually, Japanese press, interestingly enough, was questioning the issue of extended deterrence and what does it mean. So it's very much on the table. One more question. The gentleman in the back with the light jacket. So I have terrible far, far side of vision. You're describing the fashion. That's why I wear it. It <laughs> well, sticks you know, down. We, we always comment on women's fashion. I'm going to call the men by their jackets. <laughs> Bonjour, Mr. Ambassador. I have a question for you. Uh, thank you for being here, and thank you for your mini lecture on geopolitics, particularly from the Russian perspective. As you well know, throughout its history, uh, Russia has been most vulnerable when they were decentralized. Uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union obviously represents significant decentralization. Um, <clears throat> I would as assume that you would include Georgia in your assessment of looking through Russian eyes that that was predictable. I would ask you to put those spectacles back on and ask what do you think Gospodin Putin's thoughts are as it relates to Moldova and the Baltic states. You know, again, I'm not in the I'm mean, not in the brain of President Putin. You know, really, it's very clear. But when we 
when we are now, what I, I want to say, when we are in a sense uh, facing, I said, a traditional conflict, there is, uh, uh, we have also to send the right message uh, to Russia. You know, we have also to draw the red lines to say, uh, you know, uh, here, you know, the Article 5 of NATO is a serious Article 5. We are, taken, we are taking it seriously. And the, member, the Baltic states are members of our alliance. And we are determined uh, to implement the Article 5, which means to contribute to the defense, the, self, the defense of the Baltic states if they were victims of an aggression. And, and it's what we are doing. You know, the French, we have deployed uh, armored uh, elements in Poland. Uh, we are taking part in, the, in air surveillance uh, over uh, Baltic states. So we have to send these very clear signals uh, in a sort of, this sort of, a, it's not a game, but it's this sort of sending signals and counter signals uh, to try uh, to, to, to be predictable. It's, you know, in this sort of international relations, there is nothing worse than not knowing what the other side is going to do, you know, to avoid miscalculation. So we have to be very clear to, to, to Russia that will uh, stick to the Article 5 that the, with Poland or with the Baltic states. And I think that's the message uh, that, we have, uh, that we have sent. Right. We have time for one more brief um, question, if you'd like to raise your hand. I know the German ambassador is in the room. I don't know if he wanted to weigh into um, the debate, perhaps. <laughs> uh, but otherwise, uh, we'll take exactly. a question from uh, the lady in the room, in, uh, at the table uh, in the middle of the room. You raised the point. Could you introduce yourself? Oh, I'm Mitzi Wertheim with the Naval Postgraduate School. Um, you raised the point of the role of the American Congress. My own view is the American Congress are elected by an American public who understand so little about how government works. Um, Alan Alda has figured out that if you want to reach the American public, you have to write for 11 year olds. Look at his flame story on the internet. How do we get the academics, the media, to start explaining to the American public how this works? Because the rest of it is done in code. And our voters need to understand how to vote. I'll jump how in on how, that. Does, how do gonna, you make Europe relevant to the I'm, American voter? I'm going to jump in on that. I but, think our embassies, and we talked about the activism of the ambassadors. I think the embassy's engagement with uh, the legislative branch matters greatly. By the way, something that I'm personally concerned about, being with an academic institution, um, I, my own academic background was actually in European affairs. And you know, that's an area that has been on the decline academically. That's a vehicle via which we can re-energize and have the next generation focused on many of these challenges that we've been discussing. Those would be some of the ways that I would move that agenda forward. All right. Thank you all very much. Uh, Ambassador Ramon, uh, Paula, Ambassador Gerard, thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you. thank you all very much as well for joining. And of course, there are more panels on both NATO and Europe and Russia and Ukraine in the program.